Well, good morning. I appreciate uh, your patience uh, for a few minutes. If you didn't all know, well, folks are taking care of uh, Joanne who fell and uh, so working on, uh, on taking care of her. So we'll keep her in, in our prayers uh, this morning as well. Um, let's see, for uh, announcements for this week, it's now, uh, today is the first Sunday of Lent, and we have uh, Lenten uh, services coming up on uh, Wednesdays. So the uh, services will be at uh, 7.30, and mark that in your bulletin. We just, um, I, I miss seeing, but it uh, says 7 in the bulletin. The service will be at uh, 7.30. Um, we have, uh, hmm? yeah, go ahead. Announcements uh, we need today. Yes. Yeah, Tuesday is the men and mission and sausage to supper. Five to seven if you want to help cook it. See us over at the village shop at noon. All right. Sounds great. So always uh, look forward to that. Yes, sir. So we'll add uh, Ray as well as Joan to our prayers today. Joanne. <laughs> wrote it. Um, all right, and then uh, just a note on, uh, do you have any other announcements? Okay. Uh, note on the service then. Uh, note that uh, in place of the, uh, the curie, we have a uh, um, uh, Lenten Lenten-y, uh, in your printed in your bulletin. Uh, in place of the hymn of praise, uh, the hymn and the cross of Christ, thy glory, um, just a little uh, change for the season of Lent on uh, those parts. So just as you, uh, to note that as we go along in our service. Uh, and, the, uh, and the gospel acclamation, just before reading the gospel, um, will be, uh, oh, how he loves you and me, uh, which we've done um, for a number of years now, and those words will be on the screen. So we have... Uh, Anything else? All right, we'll begin our worship uh, with our brief order for confession and forgiveness. We worship as we're baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desire is known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be life in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Come to Christ, bring all your hurts and sorrows. Have mercy on us, Lord. Come to Christ, handing over all your cares and burdens. Have mercy on us, Lord. Come to Christ, knowing that he is always with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray together the prayer of the day. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you save the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protect and do sign from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading for today is Genesis 9, 8 through 17. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth, with you as many as can came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the boat is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant that I establish between me and all flesh that is on earth. Today's psalm is 25, 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your ways. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all day long. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. You are gracious and upright, O oh Lord. Therefore you teach sinners in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant and your testimony. Second reading for today is 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in firmer former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through the water. And baptism, which is this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Now I invite the uh, kids to come forward for children's message.
Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Do you like the snow outside? No? You're tired of it? When it first comes, right, you might like to play in it a little bit, and then as the winter goes on, we all get a little bit tired of it. But have, have you seen um, people playing in the snow on TV at all recently? You haven't seen any of the Winter Olympics? People skiing and skating and, and snowboarding. Yeah, OK. So well, we've got people competing in all these sports uh, halfway around the world in, uh, in South Korea this time. And, and they're competing in, in all these different sports. And they're going sometimes to be the fastest or do the biggest tricks. Um, to do the biggest jumps and spins and turns. Um, and those are things that are really hard to do. In fact, sometimes I say when you can tell someone somebody's really good is when they do something really hard like that, like be skating along on ice skates and jump and spin four times in the air and land on your ice skates. That's pretty hard to do. <laughs> I doubt any of us can do that. But, uh, but the people who are really good can make it look easy. And that's really good. Now, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, um, doing sports kind of things and, and, uh, and getting ready to do them. And I thought about a story that, um, that my dad told. And this is not about winter sports, but uh, it was about one time um, in school when uh, he was running cross country. So this would be like running a three mile race, OK? Um, so now he wasn't the fastest on the team. and. Uh, and so it didn't really matter all that much what he did when he was running the race. He was just running it. But um, when he was running the race, there was a, a part where, uh, where they were running um, around the outside of a baseball diamond. And at the baseball diamond, you know what the dugout is? Like it's kind of a little building with the bench in it where, uh, where people sit when they're not playing on the field in baseball. So when he was running behind that, he was getting tired as he was running. And he realized that when he was running behind that, people were on the other side and they couldn't see him. So he was running along and then he said once he got behind that and he realized people couldn't see him, he took a break and was walking. And then he came out the other side running. <laughs> but when people couldn't see him, he was walking because he was tired. Um, you ever, sometimes you're playing a game or something, you, you, you want to take a shortcut or you want to um, take a break or, or go take the easy way. We all do that sometimes. And I tell that story because my dad tells that story. You know, um, it's kind of a funny thing that happened. You can imagine seeing somebody run and they run behind a wall and you expect them to come out about the same pace that they ran behind. And then you're waiting and you're waiting and then they come out running again. Um, so it's kind of funny, but things that can happen sometimes when other people can't see. Well, these people that are, that are doing these, uh, these Olympic sports, uh, you wouldn't even, most of you remember the last time that they did it. Every four years, we see it on TV. Um, that four years is a long time. Now, they do, they do these sports other times, but they do a lot of training. They do a lot of stuff, and, and just a building somewhere where nobody's looking uh, except their coach. And so if they're going to, skate along and jump and spin four times in the air and land. They're doing that with no crowds cheering. They're having to practice it. They're, they're, when they're first learning to do it, they're falling down um, and spending all this time when nobody is looking and they're working on it. Well, that's hard work. If they took the easy way out, they wouldn't ever learn to do it. In the gospel we're about to hear, Jesus um, after Jesus' baptism, then, then he went out into the wilderness where there's nobody else around, way out in like the desert, and he's by himself, um, and, uh, and he's out there for 40 days by himself, nobody to see what he's doing. And there, <clears throat> he's tempted to take the easy way out. Instead of going on and doing all the rest of the things that Jesus was going to do, and there were hard things and ended up leading to him being crucified on the cross, he could have taken the easy way out when he was out there by himself in the desert. 
He could have decided to do things a different way. But instead of taking the easy way out, Jesus decided to go ahead with what he was going to do for us. To, to give his life for people, to do hard things, to have people say bad things about him because he was doing good things for other people. I know that sounds weird, but it actually happens a lot. And especially happened with Jesus. Um, and to the point where he was crucified and died on a cross. Jesus didn't take the easy way out. Um, he did what he had to do uh, to bring God's love and salvation to the world so that we can have life with God forever. So Jesus, when, when no one was looking, he did what he needed to do. He chose to do what, uh, what he needed to do, even to go to his cross for our sake. So let's pray. God, we thank you for the love of Jesus. Uh, even when no one was looking to choose to do what is good for us, to give your love to us, to go to his cross for us. We thank you for this and for Jesus' great love. Amen. Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the Gospel of the Lord. But does today's uh, gospel lesson sound familiar to anybody? Like, recently familiar? Um, if you've been in church in just the, the past uh, month and a half, that's been 2018, we've already had parts of, two parts of this gospel, the first part and the last part, that we already read and, and already preached on here. So, um, there are two verses in today's gospel on the temptation of Jesus. That's the two verses that I've got to, uh, to work with. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not even the, the longer, more detailed versions of the temptation found elsewhere. Um, we just have these two verses today. Sandwiched between the story of Jesus' baptism and Jesus going around preaching uh, about the kingdom of God. But maybe that is a thing worth noticing. That the temptation of Jesus is this transition between Jesus' baptism and Jesus' ministry beginning. So get this. The Holy Spirit, right after the baptism, immediately, as Mark loves to say, but still, immediately, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. Um, today, if we said drives out into the wilderness, we think, you know, got in a Jeep and drove out there. But no, he drives him out into the wilderness like Jesus is compelled with his, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, he is compelled to go away from everybody, to go out into the wilderness, to go out into the desert by himself. He's not taking any provisions, just go. Driven 
by the Spirit. Feet getting weary from the rocky terrain. You ever walked over big rocks in the desert? It's slow going. It's hard work. He's thirsty. He's hungry. Hearing the wild animals in the night. Have you ever been camping? Who likes that one, huh? And maybe most challenging of all, out there alone, with no one else, alone with his thoughts. They have a TV show that they've done about that, people camping out by themselves alone. Those people tend to say that uh, um, a lot of them, even if they can find sources of water and food, that being alone with their thoughts is some of the hardest things. But Jesus is alone with his thoughts, knowing what he has to do, knowing how hard it's going to be. Now Jesus has just come from his baptism, this incredible affirmation of who he is. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. This incredible high moment. He's, he's anointed. He's chosen. And his baptism gets him in trouble. Because he is anointed. And he is chosen. For hard things. To give himself for the world. To stand against the powers of the world that destroy. Yeah, go ahead and stand up to destructive powers of the world. See what happens. He's chosen. His baptism gets him in trouble. If Jesus is going to set people free, he's going to face huge opposition. And even though the temptations aren't described in Mark, the way described elsewhere, it's clear that the temptation, especially even just by being sandwiched between the baptism and his mission, that, that the temptation will be to compromise on his mission. To take the easy way out. To not do what he has to do. To do what's comfortable. To do what's easy. Instead of doing what sets people free. Well, in your baptism and in my baptism, we also are claimed by God. It's an incredible affirmation of who we are. You are a beloved child of God. That is your identity and my identity over and above anything else. It's an incredible thing that we have been given. And you and I also have a calling in our baptism to be a part of Jesus' mission of setting people free in the gospel. Of course, we're not the Messiah, we're not the ones accomplishing it, but we are following and we are part of that mission. And so naturally, your baptism will get you in trouble too, as will mine. The Holy Spirit drives us into it. We, fear, we hear the callings. We, we know what needs to be done. But it brings trouble. Because setting people free in the gospel is not easy because powers of the world that want to destroy um, don't take kindly to being challenged. I personally, I know all too well the temptation to take the easy way out. And there are all kinds of temptations. But today, we're talking about this temptation to give in, to back away from the mission of Jesus. Now, understand this. It's <clears throat> what I say about temptation to take the easy way out. Uh, look, it isn't hard to say Jesus loves you. It, it's not even hard to, uh, to preach about forgiveness of sins. That's relatively easy, that part of the gospel. But living like Jesus loves everybody... Stepping up and calling out destructive things, things like racism, to put yourself on the line against stuff like that, because God loves everybody, that can be hard. That's the kind of thing where people can be tempted to take 
the easy way out to not say something. Let it go. Don't get too specific in challenging things. Look, people hated Jesus. Because of the people that he spent his time with, people said that he was unclean. Look, he, he spent his time with and he, and he touched those unclean people. People said that he was unfaithful. People said and implied that Jesus didn't follow the Bible because he wasn't doing it the way that they understood. That the, people said he must not be religious. Because Jesus was loving everyone. Now, I'm not saying that our call is to be provocative just to be that way, but the more that I study Jesus, the longer time I spend trying to follow, the more concerned I get that, well, I get concerned if I'm not loving people enough to bother somebody. If somebody is not bothered by the way I'm trying to love people, I wonder if I'm working hard enough at it. In fact, I know exactly the times when I'm giving in the temptations to take the easy way out, to try not to, not to rock the boat instead of standing up for the love of God. The temptation is real, especially for someone who's got as many things going for them in life as I've had going for me. And it's disgusting to myself when I give in to it, but it's happened. With that in mind, with understanding what that's like, what that temptation is, I thank God that Jesus did not give in to the temptation to back away from his mission. Jesus could have taken the easy way out, and we'd all be up a creek, up a dry creek in the wilderness with uh, no help. Because none of us is going to impress anyone, least of all God, with, with our holiness. We need Jesus. We need him to do what he did for us. And Jesus didn't give in to the temptation. Jesus didn't take the easy way out. Jesus ate with the outcasts and the sinners. Jesus touched the lepers to heal them, even though he didn't even have to touch them to heal them. But he did it to make a point that God's love was that strong for them. Jesus defended when his disciples picked grain on the Sabbath. Because they were hungry. Jesus healed people when they needed it, including on the Sabbath, regardless of what people thought about it. Jesus refused to take up arms to defend himself. Instead, he said, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. That's contrary to everything that the world believes. But he gave his life. Falsely accused and suffering on the cross, taking all the result of human sin on himself. When I say that, you could look at any kind of sin and it leads into the destruction, into the crucifixion. He took all that on himself so that he could destroy the power of sin and death so it would not have power over us. So it could not claim us. So it could not say, I own you. No, instead, Jesus could say, you are mine forever. Nothing has power over you. Not sin, not death. Jesus didn't take the easy way out. He gave everything to carry out his mission and change the world. Jesus has done the hard part. And so I can say that when I have tried to follow Jesus, the times when, when I have tried to take the risk for the gospel, instead of giving in temptations and backing down, every time I've tried... Though it can be scary, it's been good. Every time it's borne fruit, every time it's made a difference for somebody. Every time I found the gospel really does matter more than whatever it might be in the moment that I'm afraid of. Like Jesus' baptism and like Jesus' mission, our baptism and our mission will get us into trouble. And there will be temptations to take the easy way out. But because of what Jesus has done, we already have a place with God forever. There is nothing that can take the most important thing away from us. And because of what Jesus has done, there's nothing really to be afraid of. As long as we're following in Jesus' mission to set people free, Jesus is always there. 
in that mission. Always there with us. Because it's Jesus' mission after all. And Jesus never gives in. And Jesus doesn't go away. He gives all of himself for his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now you may stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken of your prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, we pray for your church. May we trust in the goodness of your love. Take a risk to follow you in the gospel, knowing that because you have conquered temptation, you are always with us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all who suffer from disease, epidemic, war, those who suffer from disasters, from oppression, those without enough work, those without homes or food, for all who need your care and your transformation, Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray, particularly this day, for all those who grieve and suffer from yet another shooting in our country. As we remember them with all victims of violence, we pray for transformation and for whatever it may be, whatever it takes to not have to keep going through this. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all of those who are sick and need of healing. For Martin and Irene, Dixie, Lee, Julia, Marilyn, Barb, Don, Pat, Melissa, Tim, Pat, Helene, Steve, Pam, Marsha, Braden, Rosamond, Becky, Al, Jim, Bonnie, Herb, Arlene, Ray, Joanne, and all for whom we pray. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give thanks for all who have gone before and pray with all of those who grieve. Lord, in your mercy. And to your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I... <coughs> Forgot to have uh, Connie include this in the bulletin, but uh, um, today is the day we had decided upon for uh, installation of uh, officers and um, those entrusted to leadership in our congregation. So I'd ask those folks to come forward. Council, Murray, Heather, and Mark, and Missy, and Matt, and Sunday School Superintendent, Renee. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, and the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives to everyone ability for a particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. You've been called and elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You're to use, <clears throat> you're to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect him in whose name we gather. You're to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and that God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You're to be diligent in your specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain that life and harmony of this congregation on behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ. I ask you, are you ready to accept and faithfully carry out the duties of this office to which you have been called and elected? If so, answer yes by the help of God. Yes, God. People of God, I ask you, will you support these leaders and will you, uh, in the mutual ministry that Christ has given um, has given you to all who are baptized, and so answer yes by the help of God. Yes, by the help of God. I now declare you to be installed as officers and leaders of this congregation. God bless you with the Holy Spirit that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. We share a sign of Christ's peace.
peace. You don't have to go to school tomorrow, right? That's peaceful. <laughs> Don't walk away from the camera with the headphones on. Because you'll not take 30 of the camera over. Okay. Let's go say hi to you. And it's the only people that are jerks. Ask her. Are you going to hide? I agree with whatever you say. Of course. Alright, look out. Get your fingers stepped on. Come on to pick you up. Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. 
Renew our zeal and faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we wait for his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this Holy Communion we may know the unity that we share with all of your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you now to stand as we receive the blessing of Christ on the table. In the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.